there's a scripture that many believers do not believe. You know, I, many times I've, I've got up and I've told people when just start the service, you know, because you didn't have a good song ready or anything. And I would ask the question, somebody quote your favorite scripture. What would pop in your mind right away? Well, huh? I can do all th- that. Now, that's a good one. Through Christ, it strengthens me. Anybody else? Bless the Lord at all times. Yeah, go ahead. I didn't hear that one. What? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and he, and he shall what? And well, you know the whole thing. Sh- shut up, Amen. <laughs> I've done this in many, many places and had people do it. One scripture that n- nobody, nobody believes and nobody quotes. Listen, here it is. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and the called according to his purpose. People say they, they quote that and they smile and they, but they say they believe it, but I don't know when bad things happen, I, I can't see God in it myself. I had to get way on down the line somewhere and then look back on it and say, well, that was God moving. Amen. I, I can't see it at the time. Maybe you can, I can't. When bad things happen, it just tears me apart. Does anybody else? I don't remember that scripture then. (laughs) Because I can't imagine anything happening for good that's bad. Amen? But God makes wisdom come out of foolishness, and we know that to be true. Bad things happen, uh, as Robert Schuller said, bad things happen to good people. Amen. There is a rapper, I won't call his name because you might know who Jay-Z is. <laughs> but he said, I wonder why bad things happen to good people. Then I remember that we live in a world of evil. And it's true, we do. Bad things will happen in your life every once in a while. But listen to what I'm going to tell you right now. Write it down. Uh, Get a tattoo, write it down your arm. (laughs) It's not what happens. It's what you do that counts. Uh, I've seen people get a a trial, and it just knocks them down, and they don't know what to do anymore. They're out of it. One little trial. One thing happens to them, and they're they're out of it. They're gone. They They can't control it. They don't know what to do next. One thing can happen. And then somebody else comes along, the same thing, identical happens to them, knocks them down in the same way, they're laying in the same gutter, and all of a sudden, they get strength out of it. Now, what up with that? How does it happen with some people? It knocks them down completely, and they never rise again. And then you get the same kind of person that has the same kind of thing happen to them, And instead of getting weaker, they get stronger. I would suggest to you that one of them might know the Lord. Amen. Amen. Because when we're weak, that's when we say we're strong. I'm going to give you some more in Romans 8. Romans, the 8th chapter, is one of the greatest chapters in the entire Holy Bible. I mean all of it. It's got everything covered in there. Everything. Everything. You might ought to read it, start at the beginning of it, and study every verse. But here is something that I want to read to you, verse 35 to start with. What can we say in response to all of this? You know, all of the things that happen. What can we say in response? I've got a living Bible translation here. To the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and to our certain destination of being transfigured into Christ's likenesses. You all know what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? That's when God came down and entered into the form of a man. He sent first a vision of Moses and then a vision of Elijah. And then when they looked up, Moses and Elijah had disappeared and there was only Jesus standing there. And they saw no man save Jesus only. You can't quote that in Trinity churches, but I do. Hallelujah. 
I only see Jesus only. You see what you want to see. It's all right with me. The thing is, child of God, that word transfigure means a change of inner substance. We're going to be transfigured into the Christ's likeness on the inside. It's a transfigurement. Uh, uh, we, uh, uh, the word in Greek, uh, not to go Greek on you here, but let me tell you, the word is metamorphoses. A metamorphosis is what happens to a, a worm when it crawls up on a limb in the fall and then it weaves a, a house around it and in the springtime it comes back out and it's not a worm anymore. Now it's a butterfly. That's what was used to describe what happened to Jesus. I myself believed he walked up that mountain more like Mary, but when he came down the mountain he was more like God. Amen. Amen. You believe what you want, that's just me talking. And all the things we meet serving the end, what shall we say to this bewildering glory that God is going to transfigure us into the image of Christ? What shall we say to this bewildering glory? God has committed his son and his spirit and his attributes of omnipotence and love to ensure that every promise he has made, even to the poorest Christian, will be fulfilled. All of God is for all of us. God has not spared his son that all of us would be spared. He will most certainly give us all things when Satan charges us then God gives us the holy, adequate reply. Amen. Our reply is, Christ died. You ain't, you ain't got no power around here, devil. Christ died. Amen. No one dare condemn those who, who, whose condemnation has been taken by Christ. This is in, this is in the Bible here. That's uh, uh, verses uh, uh, 35 through 39. And then you get to verse 38, which is next. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, I'm sorry. All these end-time revelators cannot, cannot read this scripture along with their preaching on the end of time. Because they believe in a powerful devil. They believe in a powerful antichrist. They believe in a powerful one-world government. They believe in the mark of the beast. They believe in everything that you have heard that they have used to scare the hell out of Christians since 1842. No one knew any of this before then. But in 1842, this devil has great power, prince in the power of the air. Amen. But it works in the children of disobedience. They're preaching to the wrong folks here. They ought to be out here preaching to the world because the world is going to have all these things come upon them. It's not going to come on us because we're, we're in Christ's own image. Amen. I walk around here, amen. When the devil looks at me, he, look, he sees Jesus. Amen. The world doesn't do that. They're too stupid. If the world was smart, they'd be saved. Amen. Don't listen to all these talking heads. I don't care how much hairspray they use and collagen lips. Hair pieces, extensions. All of them trying to look like a Kardashian or something. I don't know. I'm talking about the men. <laughs> Come on, somebody say praise the Lord. You and I need to, uh, well, the Bible even says it. They'll have faces of men. They'll have hair like a woman, and their teeth will be like lion's teeth to tear you apart. So when you see that, the world better beware. Jesus is coming soon after that. You need to understand something, child of God, that what this scripture is telling you, listen, when the devil charges us, then God will give us the whole, holy, completely adequate reply. The reply is, Christ died for me, and no one dare condemn me because condemnation has been taken away from me by Christ. You can't look at me, and when I'm doing good, call it evil. Amen. Let not your good be evil spoken of. 
won't fight about a lot of things, but that might be one thing I'll roll up my sleeves on. When somebody calls what you're doing for God evil, that's what the world does. They pay these people millions of dollars a year to sit on there, not a brain in their head. All they do is read what's on the prompter in front of them. They ain't got enough mind to memorize what their, their story is. They got to read it. And they stand there and they or sit there and read it like they know something. They don't know nothing. If they knew anything, they wouldn't be reading those lies with a straight face. Come on, church, you need to say amen. They're calling evil good and good evil in this world. And you know it, and I know it. Amen. We know these things. But I'm going to tell you right now that what God says, who? Who is it? Shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Will that separate you? Listen, they've already tried to starve me to death. I've been persecuted. I ain't been quite naked. <laughs> At least not in public. Amen. I have fewer clothes right now that fit me than I've ever had in my life. My mama dressed me better than what I'm dressed nowadays. Nakedness or danger? Has anybody here been in danger? I mean, serious danger now where you could actually not just lose your wallet, but lose your life. Amen. I think back when I was going, driving across Botswana, <laughs> that'd be in Africa. In Botswana, we were <laughs> I was coming back from what they call Sin City. I went up there to meet somebody at the best restaurant in all of the whole country. And they called it Sin City because the, the Dutch did from down in South Africa. But coming back, I, we, we were driving down the road. I, I went back with a bunch of missionaries. And up ahead of us, I saw somebody walk out on the road. You know, what they'd do is because water was so scarce that when a car would come by, that you'd see them doing this right here. And that meant they, didn't have, they wanted some water. And if you had a bottle of water, give it to them. And so the driver started to pull over. I said, don't pull over. But he didn't pay no mind to me. I wasn't paying for the vehicle. The people in the back were. So he pulled over. When he walked out in front of the truck, the Land Rover, suddenly 25 or 30 people walked out of the jungle. And they surrounded us. They stripped everybody down to their skivvies. Uh, if that means underwear, I'm right, okay? <laughs> and we stood there and uh, they, I, and they, they were talking and I didn't know what they were talking because every once in a while I'd hear a Spanish word and I said hey and I started studying their faces and I, I saw one guy who seemed to be in charge and he was from Cuba and so I just walked right over there you know naked as I could be and I said when I get back home to Miami, do you want me to deliver a message for any of your relatives in Miami? And he looked at me and he said, yes. He said, I'll write a letter for you right now. I knew I was getting out of there alive. I didn't know about those other people. God will always give you the right thing to say. But did that scare me? Oh, yeah. I'd like to tell you I had a lot of faith. <laughs> I'd like to tell you I was bold and brave, but I wasn't. Listen to this. Shall persecution, hardship, has anybody here ever had any hardships? I don't mean like ready for supper. How many, has anybody here ever actually been so hungry that your belly growled all night long? Well, we don't talk about that much in this country anymore, but I think we'll start talking about it soon again. When I was young, my, my grandmother would always save a little crust of something to give us just before we went to bed because if we didn't have something just before we went to bed, you could hear our stomachs growling all night long. That's hunger. I suffered that. Famine. We haven't had any great famines in this country in years. About 110 years, but we may have another one. Nakedness, danger. 
My God. Uh, MC Hammer wrote a song and said, I got to pray just to make it today. Amen. Amen. If you walk out here on this street, you honestly never know if you will ever come back again. I'm talking in this area, which is supposed to be safe. It ain't. No area is safe. Not in America anymore. The thing is, listen, will danger or sword? You know, I've been looking for somebody to do a little sword play with me. Amen. I picked up the sword when I was 14. Hallelujah. I got a whole collection of swords up here. Amen. It's called me Monte Cristo. Hallelujah. No, I didn't say Crisco. I said Cristo. <laughs> the thing is, uh, are these things scare you? It should. It should scare the world. Listen, for your sake, for Jesus' sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. There was a reason. There was a reason that they didn't want anybody to come to church for two years. That they wrote mandates against it. Huh? You have to wear a mask. You can't, you can't stand close to anybody. They didn't want anybody coming to church. They knew that the church was the power. They hate everything that resists their power. You can still go to Walmart. You can still go to the liquor store. You can still buy your drugs at the drug store. Amen. You can still buy gas. They didn't worry about it there. You standing close to each other. But you come to church, you can't sing in the same choir anymore. You got to stand six feet apart. But the truth is, child of God, try as they may to destroy God's people and destroy the church. It's like if you, if you destroy my church and bury it down in the ground, it'll grow right back up. Like a seed. Come on, say amen. Listen to this. For your sakes we face death all day long and we are considered as sheep to, the, to be slaughtered. No, in all things like this, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. King James says, for I am persuaded. Here it says, I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels or demons, the present or the future, or any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. My God, the church ought to go crazy with joy right now. Amen. People ought to be happy. What? I don't have to fear all of these things? No. God has separated us into two groups of people in this world. There are those on the Lord's side, and then there's everybody else out here. Don't you use all of those gloom and doom and despair scriptures to try to scare God's children. You preach that to the world. They're the ones who need to hear that. I'm telling you right now that none of these things, death or life, angels or demons, present or future, any power, height nor depth, anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is Christ Jesus our Lord. You and I should be happy because of that. That's why, because when you see other people in this world who don't love God, who don't retain God in their image, when you see them going through trouble in this land, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to worry, whatever be tied. God will take care of us. You need to say amen on this, or we'll know you're not a believer. You'll, we'll know that you don't believe Romans 8, 28. We'll know that you don't believe Romans 8, 35 through 39. That nothing by any means shall harm you. That nothing that this world can bring against you is going to hinder you and stop you. Oh, you may have to like a pothole in the street. You're not going to drive through it. You'll go around it. That's all the devil can do is throw potholes in your path. He can't stop you. He ain't going to stop the church. Come on, say amen. He's not going to stop believers. Ain't nothing the devil can do to stop a believer. 
We're believers. I'm a believer. I believe in miracles. I believe in healing. I believe in the power of God. I believe in the prosperity of God. I told the Lord the other day, Lord, I need some more money. He said, you ain't, ain't got no need for money when everybody's got money. The time you need money is when ain't nobody got money. I said, hmm. <laughs> when the world is running out of money, I'm going to have money. Amen. I'm going to go walk in Jerusalem just like John. Hallelujah. Some of us need to be happy about this. So then he came, comes to the very last of all of these questions, and these things are true. And the question is, and the answer is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Let's start with some of these here. Death cannot separate us from the love of Christ. I'm going to tell you, death is a great separator. Amen. Death will make your wife cry. <laughs> Amen. I saw my wife do it. Amen. Amen. Death will make your husband cry. Amen. In your family, in your parents. When you die, amen, you're separated. Husbands and wives get separated. Uh, and uh, we're, we're warned uh, uh, that we're not to put this asunder or say it don't mean nothing. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder, but... Death will separate a spouse from her, her husband or wife. Amen. Death will do that. Amen. Amen. And if you, your husband or your wife comes and sits on the bed with you at night after you put them in the ground, I'm going to tell you, I suggest that ain't your husband or your wife. Amen. That might be a demon spirit. Amen. Come on, say amen. Huh? But we're warned, death will separate us in this life. Death destroys fellowship. Death is the, the severer of souls. It will separate us from all earthly experience. When you die, you, you know, you don't go to the movies anymore. You're separated. <laughs> Amen. You're, you're separated from listening to radio. I mean, unless you're like Catherine Kuhlman or uh, Amy McPherson, Sister Amy, they had a radio and a telephone put in their coffin. Amen. Electricity run down to it. So they can least listen to the gospel station. Isn't it, isn't it awful? That the gospel station that Sister Amy was listening to, they sold the station, and now they're playing rock and roll all day and all night. Sister Amy ain't resting easy down in that grave. Listen, rock and roll. My God, I can't. I can't listen to it very long myself. I like some songs that after a while, whoa, Hallelujah. Death terminates. Death, and death threaten everything. And we, even though it says, till death us do part, that's what it's talking about. You're parted at death. But you know, death can separate you from people, but it cannot separate you from God. I wish somebody would say amen on that one. I worked really hard on thinking about that. Death can't separate you from God. It can separate you from the world. But it, and your friends and your family and your loved ones, but it cannot separate you from God. Amen. Death cannot do this. Amen. It's impossible. Well, let's go on. Death or life, life cannot separate you from the love of Christ. Amen. Well, you don't know what I'm going through. There's hard times in our life. You know, we feel like we're a long way from God. But your life, no matter which way it takes you, it cannot separate you from the love of Christ. You know, the devil will try to separate you. The devil will try to get you while you're living. You don't have to wait till you know, uh, uh, one for you and one for me, that kind of thing at the end of time. Uh, the devil can do this. Uh, he, this is his purpose, is to separate you and make you feel that you're all alone and that you're separate even though you're alive. But you're like zombies. You're walking like you're dead, like you don't have any mind left anymore. You go through the actions of the day. The alarm clock rings. You got to get, get up. Paul McCartney wrote a song, woke up, got out of bed. I drug a comb across my head. <laughs> and the music, the way they did that, it, it had that, that beat. You just hear him tramping across the floor. <laughs> do, 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 do. He was just going through the motions. That's what the song was about. Many people are doing that today. Don't let your life 
become a repetition. We're comfortable in repetition. We do things uh, uh, the same way every time. You know, people go into a restaurant. Oh, I know what you want. And so they, the waitress already knows what you're going to eat. Well, I may try something different. No, you won't. You'll look at the menu and then you order the same thing. We're creatures of habit. Amen. Amen. Every one of us is. But I'm going to tell you right now, your life cannot be used to separate you from God. He can you. Paul spent uh, uh, six months to a year of his life, uh, 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 time and time again, six months stretches in prison. He was still alive, but it was as though he were dead. He had no fellowship with anybody. Unable to preach and evangelize, he couldn't counsel his church leaders. But Paul affirms that nothing is is this life of ours in our, this life of ours can separate us from the love of Christ. Amen. Amen. While you're living, don't be separated because you have to do this. Christ ain't going to turn you loose. Amen. Dottie Rambo's song, he was there all the time, waiting patiently in line. You have to realize that no matter what you're going through, Jesus is right there, but you have to turn to him. Make him a part of your life. Or oh, listen to this one. Neither angels nor demons. Some guy wrote a book. It was the goofiest thing I ever tried to read. I finally threw it away about angels and demons. He knew neither one of them. <laughs> he didn't know what a devil does. He didn't know what an angel did. But he sold a million of them and made movies about him. But neither angels nor demons can separate us from the love of Christ. He can destroy your trust in the Lord. Devils can do that. He did it to Simon Peter. He can destroy your trust in God, but the devil cannot destroy Christ's love for us. Come on, say amen. Peter didn't trust him, and Jesus said to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has desired to have you. I can say that to everybody here. Satan has desired to have you. He wants to do that. But listen to what Jesus said. There's a big, a big answer in here. Jesus said, I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. Amen. Peter denied the Lord. He cursed God. Read the Bible. It tells you that. He swore an oath. I know not the man. I do not know the man. Don't tell me that. Ask me that again. The truth is, child of God, Peter denied the Lord, but the Lord never forgot him. Amen. Talk about a big comeback. Nobody talks about the great comeback that St. Peter had. Boy, he was gone. Amen. He was gone. You can't get any worse than denying the Lord. Amen. That's it. You been out doing that in front of people? Well, I used to be a Christian, but I don't do that no more. Ain't nobody saved. There's nobody real. There's no real church. There's a, you're a liar. You're lying to yourself. That's the worst form of a lie. You can lie to everybody else, but don't try to lie to yourself. And you can't lie to God. God can hear heard what Peter said, but Peter was not separated from the love of God. Amen. He tried to separate himself, but he couldn't do it. Amen. Even apostles can fall into this same trap. The devil has desired you. He's tried to get a hold of you. But you see, God sends angels to us to fight the devil in our place. I believe in angels. Amen. I don't believe I can do everything, but I believe if God sends an angel, he'll beat everybody up. Amen. Come on, say amen. amen. I believe an angel can do that for me. Hallelujah. Don't, don't get all carried off in these crazy doctrines that people want to tell you. If you, if you think an angel, it never takes the, it takes the place of the Holy Ghost. Well, of course not. Amen. If an angel took the place of the Holy Ghost, the angel's name would be Holy Ghost. Amen. So we, we know there's a difference here. And God said, I have appointed angels to watch over you, lest I dash my foot against a stone. God doesn't even want me to trip. 
Amen. I kept reminding myself of that scripture when I was learning how to walk again. I was in bad shape. This whole left side was, I, I, I had no feeling. I didn't know what to do. Amen. But you know, God helped me. Hallelujah. I just kept on going. And I kept saying, Lord, I'm not going to fall because your angels are going to lift me up. They're going to bear me up on angels' wings. Hallelujah. I believed in that. I believe it then and I believe it now. It was only a few months ago. Amen. But God kept me from my feet from falling. He'll keep you from doing the same thing. Things, hallelujah, that the devil wants to do to you are unmentionable. But the things that the extent that God will go to to save you and lift you up and bless you. He'll bless you. Listen, I've quoted this many times. He'll bless you right in the presence of your enemies. Wow. What that means is your enemy is going to have to sit there and watch you get blessed. Amen. Amen. I like that. All them people trying to hinder me and block me and stop me and lie on me and on you too. Amen. They're going to have to serve you. They, God's going to make them prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies and then they're going to have to pass me the cornbread. Hallelujah. Come on church. Say amen here. God is going to bless us. And I'm not talking about what the world is going to go through. Because I tell you right now, if you're not in the protection of God and his Holy Ghost and the, the love of Jesus Christ, you're on your own. Amen. You're living in the land of Nod and don't even know about it. You're living in the, you go to the church of Ichabod. Hallelujah. The glory has departed. The truth is, child of God, you have to know that you cannot separate. God will not separate you. You, you say, well, demons, a demon came to me and told me to do that. Well, I ain't listening to that. If you knew it was a demon, why did you listen? You know he's a liar. Well, ain't a lot of you, but you all saying amen. <laughs> amen. Neither angels nor demons can separate us from the love of Christ. Well, let's get, you know, metaphysical now. You know, things present. Nothing present right now can separate you from God. There is nothing that you meet right now in the now that can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing can. All these troubles, all that we're going through that we think they're so great and so powerful coming against us, if you realize the word of God is true here, that even in any kind of trouble, the love of Christ is not going to turn you loose. Christ is not like the, many of these church denominations. If you do something wrong, they kick you out. You're gone. You're out of here. Paul said, amen. I know what Paul said. Deliver one for the destruction of the flesh that in the end he, his soul might be saved. Well, I ain't in that kind of power. Amen. I just believe that Jesus Christ, his love will never fade or fail. Does anybody else believe that? Things present. We have all kinds of sorrows and fears all the day long. I do. My biggest battle when I get up before I go to bed, my biggest battle is reminding myself that he will never leave me nor forsake me. God saved me alive for some reason and some purpose. You're alive right now. God has a purpose and a reason in mind for you. Nothing in our present right now that's happening right now. I know everybody wants me to get upset about politics in the Ukraine and what a dumb this we got and what that is and all of these things. I'm not going to let that that's happening right now I'm telling you, Putin, Zelensky, Biden, and Harris, and the NATO, they do not have enough power to separate me from the love of Christ. Amen. Can anybody say amen other than that? 
No one wants to say that the largest pornographer in all of the world is Ukrainians in Odessa. It's a two and a half billion dollar a year industry. But nobody says that because they're fighting back. Yeah, they want to keep that two billion dollars. Pornography is suffering right now because they can't get any more out. There's 30,000 homeless children on the streets in Ukraine right now that everybody has thrown out on the street. You know who goes and collects those children? Slavers. They don't call it slavery anymore. They got polite words for it now, but that's what it is. They take these children and turn them into uh, prostitutes. Sell them all over Africa and the Middle East and India. Amen. And this is the truth. That's another $5 billion a year industry. That's $10 billion, and you ain't even got started on what the real crimes are there. And everybody says, oh, send your money to the Ukraine. Let them go to work for it. They ain't got no weapons. We gave them $50 billion of weapons before the war started. Amen. And you're going to let that upset me to the point that I can't remember that Jesus Christ loves me and nothing by any means is going to harm me? They ain't coming here. There's too many believers here in this country. The devil ain't going to mess with us. You want to know why? Because I get down on my knees and pray every day. Hallelujah. And many of you do the same thing that I do. How's the devil going to get over on us? Amen. It's not guns keeping us safe individually. It's the power of God. If God said, uh, uh, Abram, if I can find 10 men, <laughs> if I can find just 10 men who are still loyal to God, I will not destroy the city. Well, I'm telling you, there's more than 10, hallelujah, in this country. There's people that ain't bowed their knee to Baal yet. They're not going to. They're not going to bow down. There's people, and it's not because they got a gun strapped around their waist, hallelujah, in their purse. The reason we're not going to bow down is because we got Jesus in our hearts. Hallelujah. We're not going to let it overtake us. Now, here, here, this is the one that everybody's harping on right now. Things in the future. You know, what does it say here? I'm convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, things present or in the future. This is where the big unknown is. People want to know what's going to happen in the future. They'll go to a fortune teller. They'll cross their palm with silver to get their knots on their head red. Hallelujah. Amen. Or their tea leaves or something. They want to know what's going to happen in the future. That's what people do. They want to know. They want, what is that moon? Look, did you see the moon? That moon's red. Is that one of the blood moons? What's going to, what does that mean it's going to happen? It don't mean nothing. No, the Bible said there's going to be blood moons. There's been blood moons all my life. Every once in a while, we have a blue moon. I even wrote a song about it. Maybe you heard it. Blue moon. Oh, no, I didn't write that. I didn't write it. I would have if I could have. Amen. We have blue moon. That ain't no sign of nothing. You want to know what a sign of something that God said is a sign? He gave us one Wednesday night. It was the brightest rainbow I have seen since I was a child. In my recollection, it started right across the street and it went all the way over and then another one, a double arc. One came right behind it and went over the same way. That's a sign. Amen. Not a sign of the judgment. It's a sign of your freedom. God said he ain't going to destroy the world with water anymore. Hallelujah, that was a covenant God made. And the ark, the, the uh, uh, rainbow is a sign of the covenant of God. God's not going to destroy us with water. That's why I know that global warming, I ain't worried about that. Hallelujah. Water ain't going to flood here. If it does, I'll get a pump. Hallelujah. You and I need to understand something. Water is not going to overtake us because of the sign in the sky. So future things, I want you to stop worrying about this. I want you to stop worrying 
about things that are going to come upon this earth. Things that are going to come upon the world. Because when it says it's coming upon the world, the whole world, listen, I am in this world, but I am not of this world. Hallelujah. It is going to come on the whole world. I can assure you of that because the Bible says so. But it's not going to touch me. Jesus Christ himself said, you'll tread upon the serpents and the scorpions and nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing, nothing by any means shall harm you. Hello. Are any of God's promises going to fail? Huh? You, you, you get your Bible out and tell me which one's going to happen that uh, God's promise to you is going to fail because an Antichrist shows up. You show me the promise in the Bible that's going to fail because somebody's got a tattoo machine writing 666 on people's foreheads or injecting them with something. You show me uh, uh, how that's going to happen. You show me what promise in the Bible disappears because of that. Well, these are interpretations of men I don't go along with the interpretations of men. I go along with exactly what the Bible says. And my future is secure because I'm sheltered safe in the arms of God. Amen. Hallelujah. He holds the whole world in the palm of his hands and he has written my name right here in the palm of his hand. Amen. Hallelujah. That's where I am. I'm sheltered in the arms of God. Devil is uh, the wicked one, toucheth him not. I'm the one that the wicked one cannot touch. Amen. You are too. Wake up. Hallelujah. Read the Bible. Amen. We need to do that. You need to realize that the events of the end of time and the catastrophes which is going to signify the world's end, the appearance of God, the Son, and the raising of the dead, the day of judgment, in all of this, we are not afraid. And if you are, I want to remind you, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. Love, power, and a sound mind. I remember that all the way from my Sunday school class when I was a little kid. <laughs> Sister, Sister, Sister Burdett, I remember her saying, this, you can remember this, love, what's that? That's your heart, power. I ain't got much anymore, but I, it used to, used to be power <laughs> and a sound mind. I still got that. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God, that's what God gives you. You work that into this end time garbage that they're spouting out here. Amen. God doesn't want you to be afraid. God doesn't want you to have any fear at all. He wants you to walk through here. Uh, uh, I, 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 I saw a little cartoon the other day and I remembered something that a, a woman told me in Clermont-Ferrand in France. She said, I just love you Americans. You're just like Tigger. I said, what? She said, Tigger, you know, in Winnie the Pooh. Tigger is always happy. <laughs> Nothing bothers him. He's always joyous. He's running around having a good time while everybody else is fearful. I said, you see Amer Americans that way? She said, yeah, that's the way America, and I said, yep, that's the way we are. Not anymore. They want you to sit there and hate your neighbor. They want you to do that. But you don't have to go along with what the world wants. You can do it. Do it secretly. Love your neighbor. Amen. You don't have to be like the world. You don't have to be deceitful. Instead, you can love those that despitefully use you. You don't have to tell them about it. You don't have to say, baby, I love you. Amen. You don't even have to say it. Just show love. Amen. Kindness. Amen. Hmm? God will never lose us in the crowd. Well, there's so many people he'll never find me. Yes, God, I read something Smith Wigglesworth said years ago. He said, God will jump over the whole crowd to get to you. Amen. Come on, say Amen. Many people can go wandering through the crowd trying to get a glimpse of Jesus, but Jesus, he, I guess he was going slow or something because of the crowd, and a woman touched his garment. He went there for the woman touching his garment. Amen. He was on his way to a ruler's house to heal his daughter, or servant, his daughter. And, and instead, a woman touched the hem of his garment. While Jesus was on his way to work a miracle, a miracle happened. 
Amen. He wouldn't pass that lady by, but she had to force her way through. Hallelujah. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. God will never lose you in the crowd. I don't care if there's 7 billion people wandering around on the face of this earth today. God didn't say how many there were. That's what they tell us. I believe it. There's people where there didn't used to be people. Amen. And more showing up every day. The truth is, but God won't lose you. No power can separate you from the love of Christ. You cannot be separated from his love. No power can do it. There is no power can do this. You and I need to uh, uh, refresh our memory on people like Corey Ten Boom. She was put in a Nazi concentration camp, a Christian and her, daughter, her sister. They were put in a Nazi concentration camp, denied food, denied uh, clothing, denied bathroom privileges. They had nothing. They had no heat. I mean, everything was horrible. But Corey Ten Boom and her sister... They prayed every morning, noon, and night. And the Nazi commander who uh, couldn't stand that because he wasn't making them fearful. And so he punished them more. Do you know at the end of the war, you know what happened? At the end of the war, that same Nazi came back and found Corey Ten Boom and said, I just bought the entire concentration camp, and if you would, will you gather up all the orphans and bring them in there? You don't have to worry about food because I'm going to pay for their food myself. The Nazi commander. I'll tell you, her testimony won his heart to the Lord. Amen. So when things start happening, powers that seem to be power over you, I'm going to tell you, go ahead. Let them do their doggondest. But what's going to happen is that God is going to use you to save your enemies. And they'll wind up serving you. God will make it so. You need to understand that. Neither height nor depth. No matter how high you get or how low you sink, it can, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing else in all creation. Nothing else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. I'm going to tell you right now, take all of your doctrines that you've got, that you're worried about, that you're confused about, put them all in one little basket and donate it to goodwill. I'll give you one good little piece of advice and then I'm going to pray for everybody. I bought, you know, my grandmother. She was a precious lady and close to God. I'll tell you, I can tell you all kinds of stories that happened with her. But I gave her Matthew Clark's commentary on the entire Bible. I mean, leather bound. I, bought, I really spent the money on it. I said, Grandma, this is the best writing that man has ever come with to talk about the Bible. And so I, I didn't see her for about six months, and I went back down through Kentucky. And I saw her, and I asked her, I said, well, how are you doing with those commentaries? Because she didn't write me a thing about it. She said, well, they're all right if you use the Bible to interpret them. I said, no, Grandma, you got it wrong. These are supposed to help you understand the Bible. She said, they don't. She said, I'm giving them all back to you. And she said, I'm going to tell you, take all your books about the Bible and throw them away and read the Bible. Amen. Amen. Isn't that something? We read a commentary to find out what the scripture means. I believe if you read the scripture and get on your knees, God will tell you what he means. Amen. That's just me. Hallelujah. That's just what I believe. Hmm. I've got a whisker in my mouth. I must have been yelling and sucking in. Hallelujah. Be coughing up like a cat. <laughs> well, I told you I wasn't a hundred percent yet. I can't describe to you the love I had for my grandmother, and on both sides. 
and my great-grandmother. My great-grandmother was blind. She went blind standing in the middle of the floor when she was 22 and was blind and lived to be 109. Blind all those years. My uh, great-grandfather, Will Griffith, uh, whose brother was the father of Andy Griffith, the movie star guy. Uh, he, he was crushed in the mines, and he, he, they made him a little chair he could sit in, but his legs were worthless. Now, what a pair that was. He couldn't walk, and she couldn't see. But she lived to be 109. Ran a grocery store. It was amazing. I can take you to the spot. They tore the house down a long time ago because in that part of the country, they, they don't want hillbillies living there anymore in those shacks. So they, as soon as somebody dies, they burn the shack down to get rid of it. Now they probably just take the wood, you know. But I went up there after my grandfather had passed away, and I, I built a house in Leslie County, Kentucky. I found a nice place. I leveled it off really good. I had one of my cousins with a tractor. He pushed it off, made it real nice. I had him come out there, and, and I said, look, I don't want any shortcuts on this. I want this to be a good house. I want it to be easy. And we built that house, and it was beautiful. Nice little house. It was made big enough for one person to live in. Two bedrooms, a living room, a kitchen and a dining room and a bathroom, of course. I'm going to put the bathroom inside. We was clever in doing this. And <laughs> I didn't tell my grandmother about it at all. Then one day, I picked up my grandmother, and we got in the car, and I said, well, we're just going to drive around the county. I haven't seen some of this for a while. So we went up to Pine Mountain State Park, and we drove back. She was enjoying herself. And then we pulled up in front of this house. I had hired a man to go to her old house, that shack she was living in, on the side of a hill in a holler, and take her best pieces of furniture, like her bed that she loved, like her dresser and, and uh, several, all of her kitchen utensils and stuff she was used to. And I had them moved over there while we were out driving around. I said, you have to have this done by 4 o'clock. And so I got there maybe about 5, and I said, well, we've got to stop one more place, Grandma. I never called her Grandma. It was Mommy. And we pulled up there, and she said, well, who lives here? I said, well, let's go in and, and see. And so, you know, we got out, and she walked, and she was looking around at everything. We went up to the door. And I just opened the door. You can't open the door. Somebody, this is somebody's house. They'll, people down here, they're, they're uh, she used the word choir. They're choir people. <laughs> I said, I know they are. Amen. I said, but come on in. And she went in, and, and then she recognized, well, these, they have dishes just exactly like mine. That, that same cup, that's the same cup. I, it's a, a, identical. I didn't know anybody had one. And then I told her, I said, well, Grandma, this is your house. She said, she ran her fingers over the counter in the kitchen, and she said, oh, this is way too nice for me. I said, no, it ain't. This is yours, and it's paid for. The deed is laying right there. I picked it up, and I said, see, that's your name on there. Her name was Na uh, Nancy Asher Griffith Muncie. That's her whole lineage right there. Mine too. And uh, so I said, now, and then all of a sudden, all of her grandkids came over. Everybody came over, and they loved the house. They were going through everything, and then they left. And uh, I did too. I said, I've got to be in Cincinnati, Ohio tomorrow to start a, a tent meeting. And so I left that night. She lived in that house for one week and paid somebody her welfare money, Social Security money, 
to move all of her stuff back there to the house she came out of. She just left the, the paper deed laying there. And I asked her, I said, why did, why did you do that? She said, it was too good for me. I didn't deserve anything like that. And I thought, how many of God's people are living beneath what God wants to do for you? Because you get to a certain point and say, well, this is good enough. I don't need that. This is good enough for me. I'm telling you right now, there is nothing, nothing that God will not do for you. You can't think of what God can't do for you. I'm not talking about these, quote, special ones out here in the world. I don't care about the, none of them are that special anyway. All the, the specially anointed people that I've ever met, turns out they all have feet of clay, just like everybody else I know. Ain't no better than me. Ain't no better than you. The only thing is they've learned one thing. Maybe it's their pride. Maybe it's their ego. Maybe it's whatever it is that makes them want more. Don't be satisfied with what you have now. Because I guarantee you, when the money ain't worth nothing, and there ain't no food on the shelves, there ain't no more healing medicines, when there ain't no more good doctors worth anything, when all of this thing around you, we're in the process right now of seeing it all crash down around us. Don't be afraid. Because you've got to remember there's us and there's them. I am one of us. I am one of the family of God. I am one of God's children. I belong to God. He belongs to me. I call him dad. Hallelujah, father. Uh -huh. uh, you, you need to learn how to do that too. When I pray, I don't pray to a stranger. I don't kneel in front of a statue. I don't, uh, I don't have to imagine what God looks like. Hallelujah. If I want to see God, you know what I have to do? I have to go look at God's people. That's where God is. Amen. God's not floating around up in the sky somewhere, keeping Jupiter and Mars from running into each other. Instead, God is right here in us. You want to see God? Go get around some of God's people. You'll feel God immediately. You'll know that God is there with you and with them also. Lift both hands up to the Lord and let's praise just for a while. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I was thinking of my grandmother and I came up with a song that she used to.